Let's all pray. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, as we share tonight, that you be with each one of us. Help guide and lead our thoughts and help us to be more like you each day. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, I'd like to first comment. I changed my profile picture. I'm not sure if it's coming up. Yeah. Yeah. So you see it. Good. Good. This quote from Spirit of Prophecy fits so perfectly with this. With the firmer grass, although the human soul may cling to Jesus with all the desperate sense of his great need, Excuse me. Jesus will cling to the souls bought by his own blood with a firmer grasp than the sinner clings to him. That's from That I May Know Him, page 80, uh, and found in other places. Yeah. I'm sharing the, yes, I'm sharing the, uh, something from my archives that I have from when I would help out in prayer meeting once in a while. Isaiah's experience represents last day church. And us, in the year that King Uzzah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled with the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 4. As the prophet Isaiah beheld the glory of the Lord, he was amazed and overwhelmed with a sense of his own weakness and unworthiness. He cried, then said, I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah had denounced the sin of others, but now he sees himself exposed to the same condemnation he had pronounced upon them. He had been satisfied with a cold, lifeless ceremony in his worship of God. He had not known this until the vision was given him of the Lord. A little now appeared his wisdom and talents as he looked upon the sacredness and majesty of the sanctuary, how unworthy he was. How unfitted for sacred service. His view of himself might be expressed in the language of the Apostle Paul, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death. For Bible Commentary, page 1139. This has struck me so directly in my life. Later on in this reading, Ellen White mentions that this, Isaiah's experience is to be ours. And I believe that that until each person individually has this experience for themselves, that uh, the loud cry will not happen, that the outpouring of the latter rain cannot happen. And, uh, boy, it's a wonderful thing for God to be able to do that in our lives, to lay a, our pride in the dust and then lift us up, but not feeling bad anymore, seeing our for who we are but feeling blessed and good because because of God and what he's able to do in our life I'm not able to scroll up could someone scroll up to the next next part why well, have to scroll up yeah unless someone has comments at this point that's, that's fine as well well yeah I was, wait a second I was gonna have a comment even though it says I'm unstable here um yeah so I mean, this is one of the things that we saw, obviously, in studying righteousness by faith, is it's easy to point out the sins of others. It's much more difficult to see our own sin. And um, there is a statement which I'm trying to find here. But Ellen White says um, that we're going to be brought, I'm just really paraphrasing it, but basically we're brought through experiences that are going to reveal to us our sin that things will come out in our characters, in our actions that, that sort of catch us off guard. And, and part of that is like, we always think that when we become a Christian, you know, well, we're just going to, you know, be good and continue being good. 
but it's actually a, a purifying process of justification and sanctification. And sometimes people become self-satisfied with their religious belief, with their religious life, and have not seen the depths of their sin in their lives. And so God allows these things to be revealed through circumstances that he brings them into um, so that they can have that experience. That, that's a real paraphrase of a spirit of prophecy quote. So I'm going to try to find it. So. The thoughts are right. What's so that? I'm going to read the next part here. I'll read the next part here. Okay. But relief was sent to but but relief was sent to Isaiah in his distress. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thine lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. The vision given to Isaiah represents the condition of God's people in the last days. They are privileged to see by faith the work that is going forward in the heavenly sanctuary. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his covenant, the ark of his testament. As they look by faith into the holy of holies and see the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, they perceive that they are a people of unclean lips, a people whose lips have spoken vanity and whose talents have not been sanctified and employed to the glory of God. Well may they despair as they contrast their own weakness and unworthiness with the purity and loveliness of the glorious character of Christ. If they, like Isaiah, will receive the impression the Lord designs shall be made upon the heart, if they will humble their souls before God, there is hope for them. Bow of promises above the throne and the work done for Isaiah will be performed in them. God will respond to the petitions coming from the contrite heart. This is the work that as individuals we need to have done for us. We want the living coal from off the altar placed upon our lips. We want to hear the words spoken. Thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Yeah. So the condition of God's people in the last days you know, I've I've been blessed many times in my life when God has uh, pulled aside the curtain and showed me my sin and condition. But more specifically, more greatly, I've I've uh, gone through a few years of of seeing that uh, like never before. <laughs> and uh, you know, the here's that thing about uh, what is it? The flower being crushed gives off its fragrance. And it's true in our lives, though we are, though how's that one in Paul says, uh, though we are distressed, though we are, we are not overcome. I forget it, how it goes right now, but the idea is, is that God is faithful and, and he, he measures, he measures everything that comes into our life carefully in his hand. He really does. And boy, there's times when we may think that uh, he's not there anymore. Because we may go to dark places that, you know, the fear that we try to put into the youth. Don't go there. The angels can't go with you. But I'll tell you this. They sure stand guard at that door wherever you may go. And they're ready when you come out to, to draw you out. I'm being quite emotional because it's quite quite emotional for me. I guess when I when I stop and think about it, it doesn't overwhelm me day after day. But moments like this are are the best when I can, you know, share it too. So, um, yeah. Anyone else? Uh, I I know this is pretty big for me, but and I don't want to, you know, drama and stuff. But you know. Uh, Anyone else like to share something about their experience of in this 
in this area, you know, being humbled in the dust. I mean, you don't have to be specific, but I'm sure we all identify in one way or another. Well, one one thing I can say is that... Um, Would you mind scrolling up? Oh, go ahead. Well, yeah. So Ellen White, um, you know, makes a comment um, that when we first come to Christ, the experience that we have when we first come to Christ is to be our daily experience. I don't know if you heard that. It said my internet was unstable. You know, often, like, when it comes to the doctrine of righteousness by faith, People think it's something to be debated, but it's really something to be experienced. You know, and I, and I deal with that all the time. People asking different questions because they have different controversies over different aspects of righteousness by faith, whether it's Christ's nature or, uh, you know, do babies sin and things like that. But this experience to be brought to to see our, our need of a savior is to be a daily experience. And, and we can all say that it isn't a daily experience for us. It happens occasionally. For some people, it happened once, you know, and that's all they can refer to is, you know, their conversion. But we need to be converted daily. There, there is a statement which um, I've looked at before. I don't know if I've read it recently. Um, But this is from uh, Faith and Works. Uh, It says, the true follower of Christ will make no boastful claims to holiness. It is by the law of God that the sinner is convicted. He sees his own sinfulness in contrast with the perfect righteousness, which it enjoins. And this leads him to humility and repentance. He becomes reconciled to God through the blood of Christ, and as he continues to walk with him, he will be gaining a clearer sense of the holiness of God's character and the far-reaching nature of his requirements. He will see more clearly his own defects and will feel the need of continual repentance and faith in the blood of Christ. He who bears with him a continual sense of the presence of Christ cannot indulge self-confidence or self-righteousness. None of the prophets or apostles made proud boasts of holiness. The nearer they came to perfection of character, the less worthy and righteous they viewed themselves. But those who have the least sense of the perfection of Jesus, those who I, whose eyes are least directed to him, are the ones who make the strongest claim to perfection. We can scroll down. This kind of addresses. Uh, yeah. What I yeah. Yeah. That was, that was good. Reference again was. Um, well, that's um, page uh, 53 and 54 of Faith and Works. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, go ahead and scroll up if there's. No other comments? To... I did scroll up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was just making sure there wasn't some delay in comments. All right, then. The contrast, the contrast astonished and humiliated the prophet. He made startling confessions of the pollution of his soul. I think I, let's see. Of his soul. His own inward defilement stood out before him with startling clearness. His very words seemed vile to him. He felt altogether inefficient and unworthy. Satan, or sorry, (laughs) Isaiah was trembling and conscious smitten because of his impurity in the presence of this unsurpassed glory. In beholding his God, Isaiah had not only, sorry, reference to that last one was uh, for Bible commentary, 1140. In beholding his God, Isaiah had not only been given a view of his own unworthiness, there had come to his humbled heart the assurance of forgiveness, full and free, and he had arisen a changed man. He had seen his Lord. He had caught a glimpse of the loveliness of the divine character. He he could testify of the transformation wrought through beholding infinite love. Have you, dear reader, chosen your own way? 
Have you wandered far from God? Have you sought to feast upon the fruits of transgression, only to find them turned to ashes upon your lips? And now your life plans thwarted, and your hopes dead, do you sit alone and desolate? That voice, which has long been speaking to your heart, but to which you would not listen, comes to you. Comes to you distinct and clear. Arise ye and depart. For this is not your rest, because it is polluted. It shall destroy you, even with a sore destruction. Micah, Micah chapter 2, verse 10. Return to your father's house. He invites you, saying, Return unto me, for I have redeemed you. Come unto me. Here, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Man, that's a good promise. Yeah, so I'm sure all of us have experienced hmm. times in our lives where we have wandered, you know. I I just love that hymn, uh, well, how is it prone to wander? Go ahead. Yeah, so, well, Kelly, you have experienced this in a much more literal way than some, right? Yes and amen. Three times. I'm seven. I actually have a seven-year period in my life from 19, 1994, divorced, third month, fourth day in 94, until April something, two thousand. And one, and uh, in that time, that seven years was like being Nebuchadnezzar, you know. Um, I drank hard and everything, ran as hard as I could from God. Went to treatment centers three times. The third time, a light came on, but that was a seven-year period. When I look back, until that light came back on, experienced that. So, yes, go ahead, Theodore. You know me the most. Well, yes. I, actually, I would say among my friends. Yeah. So, um, you know, there. when I think about a situation um, like yours, I mean, obviously, it's it's in some ways quite extreme. And, you know, my experience is not as extreme, but it's just as real. So I've had my very dark periods. And, but even as, you know, we continue to move through these events of, of the final events of Earth's history, these things become clearer and clearer to our minds, right? Like where, where we have departed from God, because we, we hide it from others and we hide it from ourselves, no matter how much our profession. It's just that, for some of us, from where we where we started, maybe, you know, I've, I've had advantage over you, Kelly, you know, I mean, in the home I was raised in. So in some ways, I have less excuse, right, less, reason, less reasons to excuse my sins. But, you know, if I if I fall back to where I was, it's it's it, it doesn't appear from the surface to be as bad as you know, maybe what your experience would be. But it's just as real. It's still a departure departure from God. And, you know, I never did drugs or alcohol or things like that. So that wouldn't be a temptation for me. But there still are other things, right, that, that aren't so readily obvious. So your experience gives me hope. And, and I had hope for you this whole time, even when you seemed beyond hope at times. Heidi and I continued to pray for you. Yes, you did. I mean, Heidi was so concerned. You know, she started going to, uh, you know, AA, and Heidi yes, and I continued yes, to did. pray for you. You know, how how to help you, and and not many people would do that. She, she's the only one that did that particular thing. I had asked others to come along, go to a meeting, but no takers so far. But it's kind of intimidating as well because it's so unknown. You know, to go to a 12 step meeting of any kind, it requires a, an ability to listen and that's it or listen and share. 
your own thing. There's no cross talk, they call it. You don't hear someone else tell, say something and then try to help them by giving your solution or commenting on, on their experience. You, it, it's always bring it home yourself and speak in first person about yourself and how you may have experienced these things. And, and that's what you're doing. And, and, and the thing about having hope, and, you know, God has take, God takes my life and makes blessings from the curse, curses. He, he really does. Well, I, I'm able to, I'm able to encourage others that are, you know, where I've been and, each person, like you say, has their struggle. So when you run into someone that's struggling with an addiction to potato chips, you got a word to share with them. Remember potato chip addiction we talked about? Yeah, it's, it can seem trivial. Yeah, but it, it, it can seem trivial sometimes, the things that people are struggling with. But they're really not. They, they can be as soul-destroying because they can separate us from god we can think that we're unworthy in some way uh, for god's love and for different people it's different experiences yeah um it, it's it, it's really a, a matter of of being true how's it go to be congruent between our values and our actions and when we when we are incongruent we, we ourselves are, are thrown into panic, uh, guilt, uh, and it goes on long enough, you lose hope that it'll ever change. But God, yes, yeah, so, so we, no matter, you might, we might struggle with whatever. It, it's something that we know is to do, we know to do right, but, we don't find it within ourselves to do it. And we keep finding something, some sort of payoff in the transgression of, of whatever we're doing. Now, you see Theodore dropped out the signal. Am I still there being heard at all? Yeah. Loud and clear. Theodore, I'll get back in a sec, but I don't have a, let me pull up the readings if I can. Any, anyone else got something to share? Well, I want to thank God for all the times that he's healed me spiritually, physically, mentally, including the last couple of days where it was a choice between being taken to the ER, which I did not want to go to. I made it plain that I was not going to go, and I decided to pray about it, put on the clay fast, and I was healed in two days. I'm feeling great now. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, I know this is true post there Angela it's quite the story okay so I've, I've got another reading I... yeah I was reading um, a, uh, a testimony by a woman who was an atheist and she became a Christian and uh, she had some in interesting insights into um, sin because you know when we think of sin we think of it as you know, just restrictions upon our life. Um, but, she, and, and, and I, you know, I don't have what she said in front of me, but she, it, in, you know, it was something that she had dismissed as an atheist. But to understand really what sin is, it's something that's there to destroy you. Right? It's not, God doesn't, you know, put just restrictions upon us to, to take away our happiness. It's the destroyer. And I think about some of the things that that statement read about the destruction. You know, God has warned us of this destruction. That's why he warns us about sin. It's an enemy. It's not our friend. It just disguises itself as our friend. Yeah, I'll share the Isaiah doc as well. Well, trials and apparent failure. Another one from the prayer meeting. We all know, I'm sorry, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, verse 28. The fact that we are called upon to endure trials shows that the Lord Jesus sees in us something precious which he de desires to develop. 
If he saw in us nothing whereby he might glorify his name, he would not spend time in refining us. He does not cast worthless stones into his furnace. It is valuable ore that he refines. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. All that is perplexed, all that has perplexed us in the providences of God will in the world to come be made plain. The things hard to be understood will then find explanation. The mysteries of grace will unfold before us. Where our finite minds discovered only confusion and broken promises, we shall see the most perfect and beautiful harmony. We shall know that infinite love ordered the experiences that seemed most, most trying. That, that that part there, there's an illustration I'm reminded of, uh, needlepoint. You know, when we look at that, that, that round wooden circle that my grandmother would press cloth into and make a picture with thread of different colors. And we look at that picture and it's beautiful, you know, it's pretty neat artwork and craft. But when we look at the backside of that needlepoint, there's a tangled mess of thread everywhere and it doesn't look like anything other than a tangled mess. And uh, God's mm -hmm. going to turn turn that over for us where we will be able to see that picture in the hereafter. And we see that the infinite love made that needle point of our life. Yeah, Heidi often expressed, um, you know, just the difficulties that she had, how they shaped her. Uh, to be more compassionate and loving towards others. And, um, you know, these difficulties and trials, these things that we that seem the most trying, these, the fact is, if we could see the end from the beginning, we would realize the necessity of them. And we would choose that path. But sometimes when you're in the midst of the trial, you don't really choose it's not what you want. You want God to remove that trial. But it's his infinite love that ordered those experiences. And, I, and I've, I've found that one of the more difficult things in my, my experience in life, in my life is that the wrong choices where I've made choices, you know, against God's will. And, and then it becomes a tangled mess. And uh, we, we, we can easily despair that God could ever help us because we're uh, stubborn or rebellious in, in whatever point that we're resisting the change that he wants to make in us. Uh, there, I remember sharing with a fellow about this and he, he, uh, God warned him through, God warned me through him when he shared a, about, uh, do not be as the, as the wild ass or the donkey that needs a bit and bridle in its mouth to tell it where to go, basically paraphrasing yeah, as well. But that bit and bridle in the, in the mouth, um, God, God will put that in our mouth. And if it, the thing about a bit, when we, when you pull back on it, there's a pointed thing in the mouth of the horse that when you pull back on the reins, that very uncomfortable thing starts to poke him in the roof of the mouth. It gets his attention real quick. And uh, that's how God has worked in my life. You know, I know you and I tend to be doing most of the talking here, but, um, you know, one thing I think about here is you talk about when we make these decisions. And sometimes there's decisions that we make or choices we make. We know that they're sin. They're, they're very obvious things. And, and so we can see why we're going through the trial we're going through. But there is times that we go through trials and it's not so obvious to us of what it is that God wants to teach us or what decision or choice that we have made that has departed from his will. Because we've hid it so well from ourselves that sometimes we think that the trial is, is unjust and you know, even Job, I mean, obviously, Job did not sin with his mouth, with his lips. But Job had things that he had to learn as well. 
even in his trials. And it wasn't very obvious of, of what it is that he had to, to learn. Some people take the position, well, Job had nothing to learn, which isn't true. He, he basically lost his first family um, for a reason. They were not following God. He was doing sacrifices for them. And yet, you know, he didn't have the influence that he should have had. So there, there's lots in the story of Job that we can learn about suffering, especially the suffering of, of, of the righteous, you know, the person who is following God. Yeah, that's true. that's really important what you said about uh, things we don't see coming. And we're we're, we're uh, I don't know we're just walking along in life and doing and and we're content and right with God, you know, walking in obedience, and then something happens, of tragedies even. And that's the opportunity and, that people take to point and say, where was God? And, and this part here is, we know, like you're saying, we know God's there, but there's something we don't understand about what's the, his, his will being carried out in our life. You said, and, I think I cut you off there. Can you hear it? Hear it? What's that? Uh, I I just wondered if I cut you off there. You were saying you were going to comment as well. Some, something and no. no 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 no. That's fine. Hearing on uh, infinite love ordered the experiences that seemed most trying. All things work together for good. Our heavenly Father, our heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. Those who accept the one principle of making the service of God supreme, will find perplexities vanish and a plain path before their feet. I've experienced that, the, the, distinctly remembering uh, this times when, you know, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit said, no, do, go left instead of right, and so on. And uh, making and, and making that my, what does she say? Making making that my one principle where I, I wanted to hear listen listen and do what God was telling me and perplexities vanish things it, it's true what she says here that things started to go so much better be strong and of a good courage fear not nor be afraid of them for the Lord thy God he it is that doeth that go that doth go with thee, he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Deuteronomy thirty-one sixteen. The last one was faith I live by, page sixty-four. Some God trains by bringing them disappointment and apparent failure. It is His purpose that they shall learn to master difficulty. He inspires them with a determination to make every apparent failure prove a success. Heavenly places, page two twenty-nine. And that line of thought there, I actually thank you, Theodore. You're the first one that brought that up about the life of his disciples shall be such as one of Christ. And that, that that's later on down here, I think. So apparent failure and disappointment. You want to speak yeah, to that? It's desire. You know, that again, it's kind of broke up on my side. Yeah, the quote, the quote from Desire of Ages that uh, that you're referring to. We will write, you're saying it's in this document. Uh, I thought it was. It might not be. Here, I can just... Yeah, she has it here from Review and Herald. Yeah, but it's, it's also in Desire of Ages. Okay, I'll just carry on a bit. So... Uh, Oh, uh, well, training, trained by disappointment and apparent failure. I love that apparent failure. God is preparing humble, contrite men to be valuable workers. He is giving them an experience that human wisdom cannot explain. He works upon minds by his own wisdom. Supposed mistakes are permitted to appear 
that in unexpected ways, which human wisdom cannot comprehend, great glory may come to God. Uh, upward look, page 116. Uh, apparent failure or disappointment and apparent failure yeah. as heavenly places, page 229. Uh, I'm thinking of yes. supposed mistakes it's even in the work. Not, not in the so the, the 11 six is 9 11 upside down or 11 nine mm -hmm. good to go all right go ahead so with the last so with the last last uh one we were referring to earlier about the life of his disciples so as the world's redeemer christ was constantly confronted with apparent failure he seemed to do little of the work which he longed to do in uplifting and saving. Satanic agencies were constantly working to obstruct his way, but he would not be discouraged. Ever before him, he saw the result of his mission. Mission. He knew that truth would finally triumph in the contest with evil, and to his disciples he said, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation." But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The life of Christ's disciples is to be like his, a series of uninterrupted victories, not seen to be such here, but recognized as such in the great hereafter. Mm. Yeah. Series of uninterrupted yeah. in victories. Desire of ages, no. there's, you, you, so in Desire of Ages, there's a few more things that are added. Yeah, so in Desire of Ages, it's going to be in uh, Let Your Not Your Heart Be Troubled, is chapter, cha it's in chapter 73, and it's in page 678, I believe, um, starts on page 677, no, it starts on page 678, um, but she says something in addition here that she, she adds in Desire of Ages, that I think is important. So he talks about how Christ is constantly confronted by apparent failure, right? Messenger of mercy to this world seemed to do little that he longed to up, longed to do and uplived in and saving. Satanic agencies were constantly working to oppose his way, but he would not be discouraged. Through the prophecy of Isaiah, he declares, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. Though Israel be not gathered, yet I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. It is to Christ that the promise is given. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth. Thus saith the Lord, I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause it to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. But thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth to them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall heat nor sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them. Even by the springs of water shall he guide them. The important part here is it says, upon this word, Jesus rested, and he gave Satan no advantage. When the last steps of Christ's humiliation were to be taken, when the deepest sorrow was closing about his soul, he said to his disciples, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. The prince of this world is judged. Now shall he be cast out. With prophetic eye, Christ traced the scenes to take place in his last great conflict. He knew that when he should exclaim, it is finished, all heaven would triumph. His ear caught the distant music and the shouts of victory in the heavenly courts. He knew that the knell of Satan's empire would then be sounded and the name of Christ would be heralded from world to world throughout the universe. Christ rejoiced that he could do more for his followers than they could ask or think. He spoke with assurance, knowing that an almighty decree had been given before the world 
was made. It says I'm unstable here. Um, he knew that truth, armed with the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit, would conquer in the contest with evil, and that the blood-stained banner would wave triumphantly over his followers. He knew that the life of his trusting disciples would be like his, a series of uninterrupted victories, not seen to be such here, but recognized as such in the great hereafter. So I think what she adds in Desire of Ages, it's expanded from this in Review and Herald, but I think it's it's extremely power because, powerful because what we see is Christ is in in the midst of apparent failure. He claims the promises of God of what God is going to do because Christ's failure is he feels he has failed in his work of salvation. That he hasn't done enough, but he claims the promises of God. And, and so he knows by faith that the life of his, his disciples will be like his. And, and that this is a series of uninterrupted victories not seem to be such here. So apparently our lives are lives of failure. But in the great hereafter, we're going to see that, that these were victories. Uh, uh, one question that comes up. Hopefully that came. Is, it did. Yeah, good. I was going to say that one of the questions that comes up with a, one of the questions that comes up with a series of uninterrupted victories is when we're, flailing in a life of sin wanting to follow god so that, that's an interesting one you know stuck in sin and somehow god is bringing using that to be a victory if we repent and return it can he turns it into a victory does that make any sense that's kind of a question right? well yes but, um, ella white says something to the yeah, well, just to interrupt you here, um, Ellen White says something to the effect that these things become, these failures become like stepping stones. Like I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, but you know, because what God ultimately looks at is the end result. I mean, we are sinners, right? So it. it that God can redeem us. We, we can't look back on our life and just see, um, all these failures. We see them as a path that led us to God in spite of the fact that we were sinners. I mean, it's not saying that, you know, we sin so that we can, you know, um, you know, show God's mercy and love, right? Paul says, God forbid, but but there is something about the, the fact that in a battle where we may be wounded and injured, uh, but we survive, um, you know, heaven is cheap enough. Yeah. The one thing that also to consider is presumption, to presume that because God, God's got our back that we can carry on in the path. But once we become aware, we become comfortable. And even then, man, the, the, the graciousness of God in our life, how he endures long with us when, when no others would. Now, it'd be nice if some other people could do some sherry before we close. Just either, it yes, doesn't have to be personal experiences, but. Just even even just things that they've learned, uh, you don't have to go into detail. Yes, please. Uh, this is really these two really uh, it's good stuff on righteousness by faith. This stuff here. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna mute now and, and wait. Even questions if people have questions or things they want to clarify. Like like the old time evangelists. Anyone else before we close? Please, don't be shy, or be shy. Well, Kelly, I guess you can close with prayer. Sounds good. Our Father, we we thank you for the time we've been able to spend together sharing our hearts, uh, thoughts about how your faithfulness in our life 
even when we wander so far from you. You are the faithful shepherd who will come out in the middle of a storm, rescue our souls from rocky cliffs where we've, where we've tripped and fallen, and pull us out and rescue our souls. Thank you for that merciful love of yours in each of our lives, and may we each experience it today and every day going forward. Have glimpses of your glory like Isaiah did, and we could see our true condition, because that makes us come to you with so much sincerity and and uh, realness. It's very real. May that experience happen in each of our lives as you see fit in your timing. Thank you for the faith that you cause to grow in us as we go through these times. We see the end by faith that you will save us at last. And the firmer grip that you have on us is where we put our trust. In Jesus' name.